Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. It's like coffee with an analyst, but there's no actual coffee. Each episode, we interviewed an expert in the field of law enforcement analysis to share their career-defining stories and to get their insights on the world. Please join us on recognizing and learning from these brilliant minds as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has 24 years of law enforcement analysis experience. 22 of which she spent with Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. In addition to that, he spent 24 years in the U.S. Air Force, Intelligence and Logistics. He's the former Director of Training, Education and Career Development for ILEA. He's a college instructor, author and presenter. He fights for analytical standards. And in my book, he's the pride of El Paso. Please welcome David Jimenez. David, how are we doing? Good morning, Jason. Thanks for having me on board. All right. Well, thanks for joining me. So I want to start with your career in with the Air Force and dealing with logistics and intelligence in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s, and then eventually transitioning to the civilian world. Right. So yeah, no, we're going back quite a ways. My, my assignments in the Air Force were varied, starting with my transition into intelligence from a different occupational field. And of course, the training then was held in Denver, Colorado at an Air Force base that's no longer around. And I remember going through very basic, simplified versions of what we all now know as the intelligence cycle, report writing, briefings and presentations presentations, mapping and geodesy, and everything that was required of an analyst with the Air Force at that time. And of course, at, during that time, we're talking about the Vietnam conflict. Uh, and so while many of the graduates from schools uh, in, from Denver were actually heading out towards Vietnam and Thailand and other locations, I wound up having to go to the UK and England, uh, where I spent, uh, in fact, a total of 10 years in three separate assignments, which it was a wonderful experience. As an analyst, I got to see behind the scenes a lot of uh, activity during the Cold War and leveraging knowledge of orders of battle, which meant knowing uh, where your adversaries, tanks, ships, uh, radars, installations, uh, pretty much what comprised their military strengths and knowing the numbers, knowing the capabilities. And so it was very different than what I've been doing uh, since then. But my, I think one of the biggest highlights of my career with the Air Force happened to be with an assignment uh, towards the end of my career with a counter-narcotics joint task force here at Fort Bliss here in El Paso, Texas. And that assignment is what gave me sort of a nexus to law enforcement uh, in, in the fact that the, the organization was designed to provide support to law enforcement around the United States with, at the time, with active duty military in terms of um, construction, labor, materials, even translation services, and uh, helping especially along the southwest border with issues that are rather uh, somewhat daunting and challenging in terms of trafficking and, and drugs and, of course, human smuggling and so forth. So I got my sort of exposure to law enforcement and the sorts of expectations that they had from that assignment, which translated into uh, the, the second career that I had with uh, Homeland Security. And that was at around 1996. So a couple of questions there with just your military experience, because you mentioned that you were dealing with intelligence during the Cold War. It just seems to me that during that time, you just never knew when things could go hot. Was your experience that just at any time you didn't know you're preparing for the worst, but you didn't really know exactly when things could go awry? You're right. And that is pretty much behind the drills, the exercises, the no notice landings of aircraft on, an, on your airfield uh, to find out that it was an actual inspection team, uh, operational readiness inspection, I think they were called the ORI, which came in with 
uh, little to no notice to determine uh, battle readiness of various units and to see how you perform, whether you were an aircraft mechanic on the flight line maintenance or you were an analyst bedded uh, in the basement or underground of a facility and was communications working the way it should. Everything from security to processes were involved. So there was a lot of uh, constant drilling and because you just never knew. And, and that, that was pretty much a constant theme throughout the Cold War. And uh, I saw that in the late 80s in something that was totally unexpected that we weren't ready for and not quite sure what it meant. And that pretty much was the demise of the uh, then Soviet Union, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. When that occurred, many of us were stunned and we had this sort of, I envision this look amongst people's faces. Well, now what do we do? We've been practicing and drilling for years. And now all of a sudden we don't have this formidable 12 foot tall Ivan as we referred to them at the time. And so that really revolutionized and or even re-engineered the way we were drilling for the next conflict. And, uh, and in fact, I remember distinctly while I was in the UK, then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher had mentioned to the West in particular, not to get too much in a hurry to downsize size your your military forces because you never knew if you were going to have to in the future fight two battles or two fronts and uh, to this day i still think that that is true of course the threats that we now face are so much more complex and diverse than what we've seen during the Cold War. So yeah, it definitely prompted a change in the way we did things. And that, and that was my takeaway from my career in the Air Force uh, before transitioning. So then when you start working with the narcotics case, um, how did the military get involved in a civilian investigation for drugs? With a bit of grace and knowing the limitations of then what DOD could do and not do, ensuring that privacy civil liberties were not violated, but at the same time trying to meet the customer's needs, whether it was a sheriff uh, somewhere in Arizona or police chief elsewhere or at the county or state levels, we had to take the best of what we were able to offer and, and to integrate both uh, at the time, which was up and coming, um, open source material, leveraging the best uh, analytic tradecraft that we can into challenges facing uh, law enforcement and, and then being able to bring that to uh, the attention of law enforcement and uh, providing them with the products that they need, whether it's uh, analysis of terrain or migration patterns or what we knew about uh, drug trafficking uh, or rather drug trafficker organizations, TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures so that uh, better informed decisions could be made on the U.S. side in terms of law enforcement responses and or positioning themselves to take advantage of traffic that's moving northward into the U.S. And hopefully, whether it's with Border Patrol or the county sheriffs or a, co a combination of troopers and others, be able to be at the right place at the right time and, uh, in effect, make arrests and seizures when they can. So this leads you then to what would eventually be Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection, and getting into the civilian side of intelligence. So just what were the growing pains that you experienced or the lessons learned as you transitioned from the military side to the law enforcement intelligence side? Actually, I think there were, as I look back, uh, it's interesting you asked that question. I, I think there were a lot of interesting challenges. Uh, the Department of Defense, and of course, going beyond that with the IC intelligence community, but DOD had pretty much a um, sort of subject matter expertise or SME level of knowledge on the use of intelligence, processing, going through the cycle, analysis, integrating all sorts of information coming in, putting it through rigorous analytic standards. And so bringing that sort of experience into the federal law enforcement side, uh, my first assignment being with the, the Border Patrol, was interesting in that not everybody had that sort of background. And so it was a challenge of trying to educate many of the agents. Uh, and, th and this is a big challenge in general 
as I speak about this, for law enforcement an crime analysts or intelligence analysts in giving their consumers, their customers, uh, the law enforcement officers, sort of an idea of how intelligence works. And, and then even more importantly, what their role is, their individual role as contributors or co even collectors of information. So there were a lot of moving parts those first few years, federal law enforcement of, of trying to gain traction and uh, at the same time being able to produce new products that I wasn't familiar with and learning especially learning the terminology that, that law enforcement used, especially in federal law enforcement or border patrol. So I did that for a number of years and, and also going on the, on the, not the incentive rides, the, the go alongs, tagging along with agents, whether it was in a helicopter or in a patrol unit vehicle uh, and getting some exposure to what happens along the border and being able to then have that experience and then write to that experience into the products that I was producing at the time. So it was a kind of two ways. I was going through a learning curve as well as my consumers and customers uh, and as well as management. So it's where I picked up a lot of experience and I brought it forward into s subsequent assignments. Did you have a certain focus in terms of the intelligence that you were gathering and producing? The focus was actually multiple. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, the obvious one uh, were the trafficking of narcotics, uh, contraband coming through between the ports of entry for the border patrol that's anything other than the ports of entry uh, other than airports other than br land bridges sea seaports having to learn more about and then writing to the terrain the geography the preferred methods of smuggling the types of contraband that's being smuggled the types of containers, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, what, that was one aspect. The other aspect, obviously, was uh, smuggling of people, human smuggling, not human trafficking, but human smuggling. And that was uh, quite fascinating for a number of reasons. And in particular, with the smuggling of what they refer to as OTMs or other than Mexicans. Uh, so we've seen nationalities come from China, from Brazil, from Central and South America, from African countries, the Middle East. Therein lied quite, quite a bit of a challenge in trying to paint a picture of the plight of many of these individuals that risked everything to come into the U.S. Uh, being the social science creature I was at the time, I was more interested in their journey, their endeavors, where they came from, why did they migrate, or why did they choose these dangerous paths, and be able to write to that. So we have narcotics, we have people, and then of course all other threats. And so again, the mix of open source information integrated with, of course, law enforcement related information and materials that's not available to the public, we began to assemble an idea of, or a picture of what we were up against and what the implications were. So there, there were a lot, of, a lot of moving parts in terms of the different mission sets we had and the challenges and threats. So you use the word open source, and I think today everybody just assumes that means the internet. But Obviously, at one point in time, we didn't have the internet. That might be a surprise to some folks. When you say open source, and you're talking about the 90s. What are some examples of open source? So, and you're right, uh, pre-internet, so to speak. But in the 90s in particular, everything from newspapers to radio and television to libraries and periodicals, publications when you go to conferences, the literature that exhibitors uh, hand out, uh, court records, well, not necessarily always open source, but that was also defined as part of this thing that later became known as open source. So it was integrating a lot of this material, but the problem at the time, and even to some extent today, a lot of customers uh, or even consumers or organizations weren't very comfortable with the use of open source material for a number of reasons. And the one classic one that I can think of is it's, it's not to be trusted because it didn't come from a human source or a CI, a confidential informant, or in the military sense, it didn't come from, a, it wasn't downloaded from a satellite or, or captured by a reconnaissance aircraft or intercepted transmissions or communications 
uh, and or the proverbial classified information, which had supposedly more credibility. But as the years evolved, we've come to find out that open source is just as valuable. As you would with anything else, you're going to put open source material, information that you glean from open source material through the same analytic rigors and standards that you would for anything else. And in fact, many have argued for many years that uh, open source pretty much answers the mail for maybe up to 90% of everything that we need to know. And in fact, another argument is that we should be spending more time on that 90% ferreting out the, what, what is the truth. And then for the remainder, spend the money on technology, on hard to get uh, information so that you wind up saving money to add to uh, your pool of knowledge. So uh, open source does have its uh, challenges, but it's come through quite an evolution. And I, I think it's exciting. But as with everything else, it needs to be treated with the same approach that any analyst would use in validating and verifying uh, information and its relevance and its validity. And, and so with that, I, I'm hoping that uh, analysts that I'm speaking to today get that and, and be able to uh, embrace open source with, with that as, as a foundation on how they produce analysis. Yeah, it seems so daunting. When, I, when you think about it, all the different sources today just didn't have them 20 years ago because of the internet. You know, think of the podcasts. Podcasts alone, the number of podcasts going, going through, just uh, having to listen to those and study all of those, YouTube videos, uh, websites, so many more platforms now for people to publish open source information. It's such a large task to get a handle on. Oh, and especially in this day and age of uh, social media. And in fact, I remember reading a Hoover's Digest publication with a professor out at uh, UCLA who wrote an article about the use of uh, open source. And she referred to one of her colleagues at another university who had actually gone to Syria and met with then, or still with um, President Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and this was back in the 90s. And the instructor from uh, California had asked uh, the president flat out in terms of the things that were going on at the time, aren't you worried about a US-led invasion or something to that effect? And uh, to which supposedly Bashar al-Assad had replied, I'm more worried about Facebook. So when I saw that, I, I realized the implications of messaging in the open world or the open source world, uh, and in particular with social media. So to discount social media and open source as not really having relevance or any weight or validity in the context of examining other things that you're looking at would be a, a dire mistake. It should be treated with respect, but again, apply the analytic tradecraft standards when you process information, especially from open source. It's interesting because I think now nobody underestimates the power of social media. I think 10 years ago, they might not have envisioned all what social media has to offer and impact our society. And now today, a lot of people are questioning, does it have too much power? Absolutely. I, I think, uh, in fact, as we're seeing today in, in, the, in the turmoils of, of what we're going through, and especially uh, during the COVID pandemic, and seeing a lot of posts from various groups and organizations, uh, but more importantly, the problem of distortion and deception, and, and, and not just by uh, individuals or organizations or groups in the U.S., but even from abroad. And we really have to be careful. And, and this is the part that I think in general is a problem for most of the public. They don't necessarily have the sort of experience and or knowledge to do their own due diligence in terms of, is this really the truth? And there's so many interesting ways to decide whether or not something should be challenged. And quite often it's because they're not sourced or cited no citation or reference as to where a particular image or post comes from. And then people just fly with it without even uh, thinking about it. And uh, they take it at face value. And that's something analysts should never do. There's just a bias there, I think, that naturally occurs, but people do run with it. So it's what do they want to say? Those people that don't want to wear a mask, 
they will find things that substantiate their their want. And those people that think we should just all be locked down this whole time, they will find things that support that idea. If anybody's doing any any kind of validation, it's just a quick Google search <laughs> to maybe skim down to see, okay, yeah, this seems true. And then I'm posting if they're doing anything at all. But it's it's basically their bias of what do I want to see happen? And some may refer to that as confirmation bias. And, and that is, in and of itself is a sort of a red flag. Uh, analysts should, one, recognize their own biases to begin with before they start to weigh in on particular issues or topics. But the other one is accumulating, as you were, you were referring to, evidence, if you want to call it that, or uh, published uh, items that pretty much support your position without actually looking at the opposing views or the opposing arguments. And so when you start to line up everything that supports your position, that's a dangerous uh, area to be, be in because your, your credibility is at stake. And um, uh, quite often people in the, in the public uh, circles uh, sort of do that without even realizing um, what it's actually called and or, or the pitfalls of, of being able to stack everything in your favor without looking at a, in a balanced approach, uh, what else is evidence out there saying to the contrary? So yeah, definitely uh, something to think about. Well, let's take a quick break. When we come back, I wanna continue through your time with Homeland Security and eventually get to your current position with the West Texas Haida. You're listening to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Jason Elder and Mindy Hewn from LEA Podcasts. Mindy, how many people voted in last year's IACA election? Probably around 10 to 11 percent. Wow, is that normal? It's the unfortunate trend. Wow. What can we do to wreck that trend? I think we should start by recommending to a ton of our friends, members with the association and ask them to recommend to a ton of their friends to start voting and getting involved and we'll go from there. Uh, that sounds like a pyramid scheme. It is, <laughs> but it's a good pyramid scheme. It's for a good cause. All right. So we're going to reach out to 10 friends of ours that are members of the IACA, encourage them to vote, and then ask them to reach out to 10 of their friends to do the same. We're going to recommend 10, and this is going to wreck the trend. Exactly. All right. So how do you vote? You can vote on the IACA website at iaca.net forward slash IACA hyphen election hyphen page. Hmm. But I, I think I already voted in September. During September, it was just the nomination phase. Now that we're in October, the entire month of October is actually the voting phase. So if you only voted in September, go again to vote because the vote in September does not transfer over to October. Well, what if I don't know the candidates? On that voting page, you can find information on both our candidates. You can find more information on them via the IACA website, the forums, or if you're fans of Analyst Talk with Jason Elder, you can find information on them on LAPodcast.com with an S. Hmm. Well, what about those that think that their vote doesn't matter? It does matter. And if we looked at last year's, it was very close that one vote could have made a difference. For all in this association together, it's important that we have a voice in choosing our next leader. And if you have been a fan of our podcast, a lot of our guests have mentioned that IECA is like a second family. And when you're a part of the family, like you're important, your voice needs to be heard. So please vote. All right. So you heard it. Wreck 10, wreck the trend. So reach out to 10 of your friends, IACA members. You probably haven't talked to them all year anyway. Reach out to them, encourage them to vote and let's wreck this trend. Thank you. Welcome back. Before the break, David was talking to us about his journey from military intelligence to civilian law enforcement intelligence. And I want to continue, David, with the path that we were on. We're in the 90s, and I want to talk a little bit about 
pre 9 11 versus post 9 11 and your perspective of the events of September 11th? Uh, wow. Uh, so I guess I just did maybe a tighter box for you. It just your role as an analyst in El Paso pre 9 11 versus post 9 11. So, as were millions of others. Prior to 9-11, it was, as I refer to it, business as usual. We were looking at uh, everything that we've been doing along the border in terms of the mission for Border Patrol with alien smuggling, with narcotics trafficking, with uh, looking for wanted, dealing with other criminal events, activity along the border. 9-11, of course, came as a shock, and we weren't quite sure what it meant in the long run. Of course, we know what the answer to that is now, but at the time, as we started within the weeks and months afterwards, I I kept asking myself, well, why aren't we getting back to what we've been doing all along? Because that hasn't changed. Now, the focus, with that being said, the focus now is on, you know, the one that gets through, the things that keep people up at night, how do we look for people from other countries with an agenda trying to sneak through the border, uh, those with an agenda, terrorist groups, and so forth? We didn't see that necessarily along the southwest border. So we were still back to what we were doing before. What did change on a much larger landscape were the, was the reorganization, uh, things like the Patriot Act and the creation of Homeland Security and what that meant for the U.S. Border Patrol, what it meant for legacy U.S. Customs and the conversion into immigration and customs enforcement as we know it today, we started to see these changes take place. And of course, beyond, you know, years beyond uh, to, uh, 9-11, we started to see some changes as it related to federal law enforcement analysts in terms of training and in terms of intelligence community directives that came from the director of national intelligence years later and uh, leading to sort of the templates and models that we use today and the, the, the directives that we're embracing, uh, depending on what level of uh, government that you're in. Um, and so there were profound changes there, yes, but we're still dealing with same threats, but now even more so with a whole myriad of other threats that we didn't necessarily see immediately post 9-11, but we're now seeing today. So yeah, definitely a lot of changes for for analysts in general. Yeah. And you mentioned the Patriot Act and at the time it it was very controversial. Uh, A lot of people spoke up about the Patriot Act. It has a lot of different parts one of the things that I always remember, though, uh, that the Patriot Act did is it set up a standard way of communication between the military and the civilian side, and which wasn't necessarily there before, but there was a standard operating procedures of how both the military intelligence and law enforcement intelligence were going to communicate in the future. Is there other aspects of the Patriot Act that come to mind for you? Well, and there's a lot to go with that. Privacy and civil liberties obviously come to mind, and it's so ingrained in training programs and uh, even in some aspects with uh, training, how to use 28 CFR. Looking back at the problems that we saw, for example, with law enforcement in the early late 60s, early 70s, with the abuse of privacy and civil liberties of demonstrators and groups protesting and in demonstrations and 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 other organizations that were not committing any criminal acts but yet were investigated for no good reason other than they appeared to someone to be a threat and they weren't and so we're trying to avoid those violations of privacy and civil liberties of the 70s by making sure that not just with the Patriot Act, but other uh, actions that have been taken uh, place since then, uh, so that that law enforcement in general, and especially when it comes to collecting information, gathering information, processing it, generating sort of proactive intelligence in terms of forecasting potential outcomes, 
that we don't infringe on, on people's rights to privacy and, and the civil liberties. There's, so there's a lot of moving parts in order to balance how analysts do their work, how law enforcement agencies are perceived by the public, making sure that, again, we don't, we don't go back to what was done pre-9-11 or even back, back in the 70s that were really a total um, injustice against uh, civilians. So you eventually make your way from El Paso to D.C., which uh, leads us to a couple of your badge stories that you have. So can you talk a little bit about your transition from El Paso to D.C., and then we can get into the badge stories? So I guess an unexpected uh, badge story that I would probably want, want to mention was while I was with Border Patrol, but it wasn't something that I did as an analyst at my office with Border Patrol, it was actually receiving authorization and funding from the Border Patrol to attend an IACA conference in Florida back in, I think it was 2001 or 2000, no, it was 2002. And it was hosted by, I guess, the Florida Crime and Intelligence Analyst Association. So at that conference, something unexpected happened and it was to have a profound impact on me later. And it, it came from all things. It came from the keynote speaker, the retired uh, FBI senior executive, uh, Oliver Buck Ravel. And during his keynote, I was sitting in the front row and I was taking notes. And during his keynote, he had mentioned something that to this day, I still quote him as having said, both in, 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 in many of the classes that I've taught, as well as with my colleagues. What he had recounted in his experience as he looked back when he retired was something that caught him off guard and it was reflecting on the end of his career. And that had to do with seeing a, I think he referred to it as a global collusion amongst disparate organizations around the globe and organizations or gangs such as uh, uh, the Japanese Yakuza or the Italian Mafia, or the Russian Mafia or Chinese triad or Colombian, you know, cartels. They all had all these different sort of uh, criminal enterprises, different sorts of activities that they engaged in, extortion, murder, uh, drug trafficking and so forth. It didn't matter. The fact that many of them were found working with each other had one common theme, which the keynote had mentioned, and that was money, generating money. So as I wrote that down, I realized uh, this is uh, profound and both staggering. And to this day, we still see this. And, but one of my immediate thoughts was, if organized crime on an international level is cooperating with each other, and they, and they are, many, there are many examples, why can't law enforcement do the same thing? And I realized that there were a lot of reasons against being able to be, you know, having that sort of wishful thinking, uh, legal constraints, organizational missions, you know, the, the, the list goes on as to why we don't necessarily have that sort of cohesiveness and collusion. Although a lot of progress, uh, others would argue we have made progress and I would agree through information sharing, uh, resources, uh, even the risk projects as an example, uh, regional information sharing systems. And, and there's just so many other, I would even dare say IACA and its collaborative nature, not just in the email exchanges, but also in their forums, helping others improve their work processes. Uh, so I think th there are examples of how this is being done successfully at the local, state, county, federal levels. So we need to always keep in mind that, yeah, we may be outnumbered and outgunned and out technologicalized. I think I just made that word up. But <laughs> um, we need to be very mindful that an adversary, uh, whatever that may be, wherever they may be, is always leveraging their knowledge of their adversary, which is us, which is law enforcement. And then have you worked on many cases then where you're following the money? Not the financial aspect. Of course, in ICE at headquarters, uh, we have many different subdivisions under the intelligence branch, financial being one of them. I wasn't 
uh, part of that group. And so I'm not able to elaborate. Actually, I'm not able to elaborate on that or any other cases, uh, even though I'm long gone from government service. What I did work on were a number of other projects that are related to human smuggling, uh, narcotics trafficking. But one of the things that we did work on, or rather embraced as a strategy, which can be publicly accessed or resourced in open source, was a concept called the Illicit Pathways Attack Strategy, or IPASS. And that was uh, simply an approach on being able to work with other countries in looking at how criminal enterprises were using airports, seaports, land ports, hotels, highways, air routes to further their criminal uh, activity, whether it was smuggling people, contraband, high profile targets, and being able to work with host countries so that they could leverage their law enforcement resources and their knowledge to make it more expensive for criminal organizations to operate in the way that they have been doing and or forcing them to make alternative choices or throwing them off balance. So that strategy was sort of part and parcel uh, that cut across a lot of the mission sets in at ICE Intel. But I, I'm sorry, I'm not able to really delve into any uh, case specific data. Okay. So as you're transitioning to DC, then are you still have pretty much the same task, the same mission? Well, one of the most fascinating things that happened to me was actually at the basic training for ICE analysts. Uh, at the time, it was in Glencoe, Georgia. It was actually the legal block that lasted several weeks. And it was, it was, I was just astounded, a staggering, more than 400 statutes and authorities on the books that ICE had oversight for and, uh, and across the globe. And on mission sets that I had really didn't even realize that ICE looked over. And it included things like proliferation of weapon systems, uh, pharmaceuticals and counterfeit uh, intellectual property theft, pharmaceuticals being sold on the internet, NFL jer counterfeit jerseys and, <laughs> and other knockoffs that uh, were being marketed. And, and, and it's pretty much a, a loss of revenue for American businesses. Uh, everything else from uh, theft of antiquities and returning many of these uh, artifacts back to their original countries, looking for war criminals. And of course, the, the usual uh, mission sets for human smuggling, in addition to human trafficking, which is another big portfolio under the ICE mission, narcotic smuggling. And, but with ICE being the largest investigative arm uh, of Homeland Security, they had a lot of responsibility to go with many of the men and women uh, charged with uh, carrying out those, those mission sets. So it was a fascinating experience to be with them. And, and not just uh, from a headquarters perspective, but knowing what they do out in the field all across the country, um, the different field offices, and the analysts that are um, making those offices function based on what their needs are for their particular geographic areas. So it was quite, quite the experience to be immersed in all that. And it was a very fast moving train. One of the biggest takeaways had to do with sharing and collabor collaboration with other agencies and other analysts both officially in a work setting, as well as socially in many of the evening uh, functions that were hosted by organizations such as the Intelligence National Security Alliance, which had seminars and brought in speakers from uh, the intelligence community and or the military. And it was always great to bring a business card and network with uh, academia, with students with military, private sector, government officials, and law enforcement folks. So I was in my comfort zone, so to speak. And it's something that I believe in. I, I can't do it now as much now in El Paso, but I think any analyst that has that opportunity, and they will, especially with IACA and uh, other groups such as ILEA at their conferences, once we go from this to a post-COVID environment, by all means, uh, network, network, network. Let's take another break. And when we come back, I do want to talk a little bit about your current position with the West Texas HIDA. And I also want to get into some of your advice for analysts today. You're listening to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Sally Sarabar, here to tell you that nobody needs to know what first car you have 
or what's your pet's name or what street you grew up on. We all see these on Facebook and we all want to answer them. But keep in mind that there are people who are reading them and they're going to go on your bank account and they're going to say, oh, I forgot my password. Let me reset it. And the bank's going to ask, what's the first street you lived on? What is your cat's name? And what color car did you own? And the person reading it, they're going to look through your questions and they're going to answer and they're going to get access to your bank account. We call that social engineering. So next time you see that survey, that questionnaire, don't. Hi, this is Steve French, and I have a little phrase for you to remember. Uh, a phrase that stuck with me throughout my time as an analyst is a quote from Sherlock Holmes. When you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Welcome back. Just a reminder, if for those that may be new to the podcast, in our show notes, we list the names that are mentioned during each episode. If you want more information on anything that we ever talk about on this podcast, please check out the show notes. They can be found on our website, LEA Podcasts, plural, L-E-A-P-O-D-C-A-S-T-S dot com. All right, David, this last segment here, I want to finish up with your current role at the West Texas Haida. And I guess for those folks that are listening that may not be familiar with the Haida program, can you just go over what Haida is? Sure. The Haida program was developed many years back, uh, and and people can research this, uh, again, open source, under the auspices of ONDCP, Office of the National Drug Control Policy. And uh, there are many Haidas located around the country. I just happen to be the one here in El Paso with West Texas Haida, which has oversight for the 12 westernmost counties in Texas. And it was fascinating to return uh, after I interviewed for the position I was hired to come back, pretty much coming back home with this experience from the past, both of course, uh, Border Patrol and, and ICE, and realizing that I had already worked with the Haida here in El Paso with West Texas Haida while I was in Border Patrol. So it was sort of revisiting old stomping grounds and familiar faces and but now it's definitely rolling up the sleeves and focusing on the threats that are posed to us uh, in general and in the public in particular, and not just El Paso, but for points beyond with the the contraband that comes through and its implications uh, for elsewhere in the country. So quite, quite a bit to look at. And, but again, leveraging the sort of the same sort of trade craft uh, analytic standards canvassing, collecting information, working with other agencies, doing a bit of analysis and producing some products, uh, as well as getting into other aspects of what Haida's in general do to include deconflicting blue on blue situations with uh, different systems. uh, And it varies from one part of the country to another as to what systems are being used. Uh, I'm back here working uh, side by side with local, county, state, and federal agencies. It's it's a wonderful experience. And and again, people ask me, are you ever going to retire? And uh, every time I've been asked that question, it's like, I, I think so. But uh, the last time I said that, I didn't. So I just, uh, I guess me and retirement never got along. For deconfliction, for those that might not know, the blue on blue, I mean, that's the idea to ensure that different agencies aren't knocking on the same door at the same time. So there's not a conflict with the different investigations going on. And not just on the same specific location or even the same target, but the, but within blocks of each other, you certainly don't want to roll up onto a scene that you've entered into a deconfliction system only to see patrol units at another location a few blocks down and either of you didn't see each other. So that's another benefit of the deconfliction is so that you can talk to the other agency and say, can you change your time or or we'll change our time or something along those lines. I'm hoping more and more agencies jump on board with their HIDA and uh, risk partnerships so that they can take advantage of these systems that don't really cost anything to use. And again, it's all about avoiding blue on blue. 
So HIDA, again, for those that might not know, is High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. So this is a great coordination effort, multi-jurisdictional, different task force solving different problems dealing with uh, narcotics. So I guess in terms of West Texas, what are some of the big problems that you're looking to curb? Actually, it's, it's sort of multi different areas. We have the, the major interstates uh, crisscrossing the Southwest. Uh, in our particular case, it's I-10. And uh, I refer to them as next door. Next door in New Mexico has several interstates crisscrossing uh, east, west, north, south. And so there, those are major avenues of which traffickers and smugglers are taking advantage of, and even the smaller roads and highways. But many of our challenges are not just the interstates and or through those transportation methods, but also between the ports of entry. And again, that's uh, the border, border patrol, that's their domain, as well as um, a number of our um, West Texas counties that also work side by side with federal agencies, whether it's dealing with human smuggling or even drug trafficking or contraband, and also the ports of entry where uh, much of what is being seized is being reported on. So that together with the transition over the last few years of opioids, synthetic op opioids and the the ramifications that that has for uh, narcotic smuggling. So no longer are criminal groups, organized uh, cartels or what have you, dependent on terrain and geography and weather conditions. And now they can operate within buildings and not have to worry about farmers and cultivating crops and dealing with opium and, and other other products. They're creating other substances, uh, whether it's fentanyl and or variations of that and or even now with uh, methamphetamine. So it, it's a constant challenge and it's really something that uh, I think all the hiders are looking at, have been looking at and continue to, to do the analytic work, continue to do the, the products to consumers and customers for their awareness so that other agencies can develop strategies. And not, not just law enforcement, but also reaching out through uh, public service, demand reduction and coordination with schools and education. So there's a lot that's behind the scenes with HIDAs. Uh, I'm not involved in that end, but, but there are people that do that. And so it's, it's, a, it's, Quite a fascinating organization to be part of and still with a foot in the door, obviously with law enforcement, but also with other aspects of the community. And the Haidas usually have various levels. So it's local, state, federal, military, all are housed usually within the Haida program. We, we, we do have uh, the local, county, state, and, uh, and federal presence, as well as some uh, uh, National Guard. And, and we do liaison with uh, active duty military organizations and their representatives that have a vested interest in what's going on along the southwest border. And we also work with other investigative support centers and uh, fusion centers in, uh, and even people that are uh, not necessarily part of our distribution list, but getting word out to them on trends, on beyond the lookouts for bolos, it, just in case they haven't seen that. And, and likewise, they'll on occasion send us things that we're not seeing in mainstream communication uh, resources. So I, and again, that's the collaborative nature of what uh, agencies should be doing and the analysts as well. All right, so now I wanna get into your advice on best practices and standards that you've used over the years. Let's just start with some of the products that you used and the best practices uh, for those products, whether it's a link chart or an intelligence report, and you do a lot of teaching anyway. So this is, how do you normally advise your students on the standards for these products? So there are a number of ways that I could help, especially with criminal justice students, uh, now that you brought that up. And, and that's the beauty of, uh, and I'm hoping that many more uh, analysts that uh, have experience under the belt might look at teaching on down the road because it's, it's one thing to deal with uh, textbooks and, you know, PDFs and chalkboard and slides 
and others that have um, advanced degrees. But the experience to bring that into the classroom, going beyond the text, I think is worth its weight in gold. And what I try to do with students in many of the courses that I've done in the past was to give them a sense of when we get to the block that has to do with analysis or the block that has to do with writing, without getting or delving into specifics, I let them know that the products that they create, it carries their reputation on it. it. It needs to be clear and concise and succinct. Some people would say brevity is the soul of wit, mm -hmm. is a quote from Shakespeare. But being precise in your title and your subject matter and then getting into details, there should be standards on how to do that as well as obviously the visuals, the images, the pictures, the photographs, they speak a thousand words, as long as you're properly sourcing those. Your analysis should be sound and it should be expressed in terms of level of confidence that you believe with a high degree or a medium degree or medium level or low level of confidence and here's why. Some of the schools that, that teach these confidence levels ask you to make sure that those are included so that it gives a person on the receiving end, a supervisor, a manager, a consumer, a customer, what have you, an idea that this is not a, a, as big of a threat as I thought it was, or I need to run this up the flagpole uh, to others. And, or this has, you know, we need to get this out to our uh, uh, officers out in the field or the patrol units, or this needs to make it to muster. Those analytic products need to have your best work put in there. And, and it deals with everything from proofing and getting a second set of eyes. And even I would venture to say exploring alternative uh, analysis, which means that if certain types of evidence didn't exist, or if they all of a sudden showed up, would it change your analysis of this product? And if so, how? I think it's to be fair to the consumer it's always good to mention that because it could very well be a question that a consumer says, you know, well, what if this happened? You may have already addressed that if you use the alternative, uh, the analysis of alternatives uh, statement in your product. So there are many ways to do this and not all agencies will go to these lengths to be that analytic in nature. But I, I think it, it, it serves the consumer well, if, if an analyst is able to actually provide value added, succinct analytic outcomes, uh, confidence levels, being able to explain and cite with specific mentions of uh, citations, uh, resources that were used, whether it's interviews of CIs or an interview of a law enforcement officer, and then talking about the reliability of those products. Based on the reliability, you render a particular confidence level that then lends more uh, weight to the, the product that you're, you're producing. What about link charts? What are some of the best practices you encourage folks to follow in terms of link charts? I haven't used uh, link charts in quite a while, but uh -huh. I've seen, I, so I, I'm an old school graduate of I2, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I remember having going back through the training and it was, I think it was in Lincoln, Nebraska, and being able to use those charts effectively. And of course, now it's, it's just evolved into such sophistication and not just I2, but other analytic software programs that generate the visuals and generate the links, I, I think is important for the, the consumer, the, end, the person on the end that's receiving it. It's one thing to talk about this, and it's another to show the images, whether it's of a uh, real estate geographic location of individuals and their relationships and timing with others. We've used, uh, I've seen the link charts used, for example, with the teachings with Penn State, I, I do a course on analytic methods in geospatial intelligence. And we have two law enforcement case studies. And in both case studies, the, stu the graduate students use many visuals to include link charts to explain what they've seen in their research in terms of criminal events that have taken place from above with aerial imagery, with distance relationships, spatial relationships in terms of time. And a lot of this speaks to the decision makers because once they see this, once you have, whether it's a link chart, a link diagram, or other visuals that explains 
what you're trying to make a point on, that sells. And, and I remember, for example, I believe it was the, the risk projects back in, uh, back east, uh, the Regional Organized Crime Information Center, or ROSIC. I remember the analysts using link charts, talking about the success stories, that by using a link chart or bringing them before a case goes to trial, sometimes there will be a, you know, they'll, they'll plead out because they see what they're up against because it's spelled out succinctly in a link diagram. And there's no way they're going to try, you know, once the jury sees this, there are examples out there of the relevance of link charts, the visuals, whether it's in an academic setting or in a law enforcement setting. Yeah. So, I mean, with link charts or even maps, as you mentioned, it's, the imagery or the visual for telling the story. And so I, my advice to the listeners would be always to keep that in mind as you're telling the story, when to use these visuals. Does the visual match your audience and what you're trying to relate? Because link charts can either be wide ranging where you, you're just showing the connections between the various groups or a link chart could be a series of events and linking each series into events like a timeline. So you can have some link charts that are very summarized and don't have a lot on the page per se. And you can also have others where they can get really messy and there's a lot going on on the page. And both can be, and both can be useful, but you have to know when and where to use each. Exactly. And that's where the, uh, the old phrase, know your customer comes in. Who's your audience? Who's getting this? Is it a shift change? Is it a jury? Uh, are, are they decision makers? Is it a, a task force setting? You really need to know who's going to see this and to what levels you're expected to be uh, elaborating on, on some of the finer points. The more cluttered it is, the more chance you're going to lose folks in the process. If you were starting out today and what would you focus on or what would you recommend somebody to get the most return out of their investment and time and effort? What do you suggest to your students focus on the most? That's an interesting question. And in fact, it's one that kind of got me roped into academia years ago. And that was uh, in, in general at the time with, and in particular with criminal justice majors and other students, now that they got their diploma, what do they do with it? Many of them have the academic skills and background in writing and to some extent, you know, research and being able to delve in, hopefully delve into uh, advanced methods and or analysis and critical thinking. But a lot of them weren't quite clear on expectat what was expected of them. And it depends on who they're trying to go to work for. So I would have to fall back on the networking and collaboration efforts, even in academia, even in the college or school setting, is to take advantage of that time with clubs, with meetings, with guest speakers, with other students, and, um, and even doing the internships, uh, trying to get, accumulate that sort of experience before you get your degree handed to you, as well as doing a lot of research into the kind of organizations that you're going to be, submit, whether it's law enforcement or even the private public sector, not all majors, um, criminal justice or others, are going to be wanting to get into law enforcement. But in this context, they should know what's expected at, say, a county sheriff's department uh, in general, what's expected at federal agency levels. And those depend, they vary. DEA obviously is going to be narcotics focused. Uh, the Border Patrol is going to be focused on multiple missions as well as ICE, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. I mean, the title speaks for itself. So you really need to get to know the mission sets and do a little bit of research before you apply so that you're able to, if anything, pick up on the things about the history and about their culture, if you can, and even talking with representatives from those agencies and or even analysts, if you can find them, so that that adds, uh, in addition to your academic pursuits, you have a little bit more under your belt when you start a job hunt, so to speak. Now, you mentioned earlier the intelligence cycle 
And I find the intelligence cycle fascinating in that it has changed over the years with all the different parts. The intelligence cycle is really the backbone of teaching intelligence analysis. And it obviously stems from the military intelligence. The one example is step one, planning and direction, two, collection, three, processing slash collation, four, analysis, five, dissemination, six, reevaluation, and then you start the cycle all over again. I particularly like collation because that's a, such an old word. Unless you deal with printers or copiers, you probably have never come across the word collation. But is there a particular step that you would either like to talk about or is a particular step that's often overlooked that needs more emphasis? There seems to be this assembly line perception of what the intelligence cycle implies that you start from this point and then when you get that, you go to this next step. It's almost like a mechanical procedure and it is the contrary. Uh, it does not work that way. In actual intelligence work, it's not like, oh, okay, I'm now in the collation or interpretation side or I'm in the integration side or I'm in the distribution, it happens. And no two agencies necessarily have the same model. And in fact, uh, with the Society of Competitive Intelligence Professionals, uh, short-term name skip for the private sector, business uh, sector, the models are kind of similar, but not the same. In crime analysis, you have procedures and steps that are different, but they're similar. They're labeled differently. They don't necessarily follow the assembly mechanical line sort of mindset. So I, I just wanted to preface uh, my answer to that by, by letting people know that the cycle, it varies from one organization to another as to what they want to call it. I, I would dare say that if you looked at the CIA model, which hardly any of us do, their cycle actually goes backwards. Instead of clockwise, it's counterclockwise. When I first saw that, I fell out of my chair. It's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> if I was to focus on a particular step more than the others, it would be hard for me to say that analysis is more important than collections. If you don't collect everything that you need, if you're missing things, you're, you're going to generate the, an analysis that may be, you know, have shortcomings or, or faulty. It didn't include everything. If you don't analyze the product concisely and professionally, and then you're missing some steps and there's not enough analytic rigor in your methods and approach, then you may generate faulty logic and or an incomplete picture. You're, you're not predicting, by the way, don't use the word predicting. That, uh, that's a kiss of death term for any analyst because it, it conjures up an image of being very definite. You never want to tell anybody you provide predictions as part of your career. What you do is you anticipate or maybe you even forecast. Uh, you generalize in, in terms that uh, with probability statements or likelihood as an example. If you don't get the product out in time, the dissemination that you mentioned, some people would say, what's the point if it's too late? You, you tell everybody about 9-11 on 9-12. I guess that's a poor analogy, but my point being is, what's the point if your product isn't out on time? What's the point if in your reevaluation or feedback from the consumer, you're not integrating their comments and or their suggestions like, this product doesn't meet my needs, here's why, or you missed the point, or I love this, keep giving me the same, so that you can go back and refine tune your, your analytic methods and processes or collection methods, or take a look at some aspect of that cycle where you can leverage change. And of course, the planning and production or the beginning process of all this. What is the consumer's needs or requirements? What are your organizational needs? At the Homeland Security uh, level, it would be things like the key intelligence questions or KIQs that drive how collection is done and then how analysis is done and what products are generated and then who does it go out to and when, how frequency, what is the urgency and so forth. My focus has always been on analysis. If you get the analysis wrong, the whole cycle is kind of a moot point. If you don't get the collection all in as much as you can, that again impacts on analysis. If you don't get the product out, your consumers don't know what you're sitting on. So I guess it's pick a card, whichever one you want. 
But if you remove any of those sort of processes from the cycle, and again, not an assembly line mentality, you would have an impact on, on your support to consumers and customers. The intelligence flow up is something that you've used over the years to demonstrate how intelligence and the investigation work hand in hand. And we will put a link to this in the show notes. So could you kind of go over what this, this chart is doing and how it should be used? Uh, sure. So back in 2005, while I was working with the Border Patrol, after having been on board for quite a while and running into time and time again, folks that weren't quite sure where intelligence and analysis sort of fits into what law enforcement does, I decided to try and see how I can visualize the efforts of what an analyst does. And looking back and looking now, I, I would think that maybe even, and not just an intel analyst per se, but even a crime analyst and or a business analyst can, can look at this and translate it into what they do to make sense. And my point here was generalizing what an analyst does in tandem with what, say, a law enforcement officer does in the course of his or her work towards successful arrest, uh, prosecution of criminal organizations or individuals, dismantling uh, an organizational hierarchy, getting successful prosecution, hopefully seeing a conviction, hopefully getting asset forfeiture involved. And all the steps that are involved from an analyst or intelligence side of things, such as querying of databases, exploitation of pocket trash, using link charts or do, using telephone toll software and analysis, uh, doing organizational charts and, and briefing uh, law enforcement at the same time in parallel with what they're doing, uh, which could be meeting with the CIs, uh, building a who's who in the organization, coordinating with other law enforcement agencies, meeting with the prosecutor. And all this flows on one page to the objective again of uh, arrest, conviction, prosecution, so forth. So I'm hoping that that's of some benefit to the membership. And again, um, if they wanna steal it, <laughs> by all means, I'm not gonna charge you with plagiarism. Actually, I'm, I'd be thrilled to hear any feedback from this. And especially if you're able to take it and translate it into what you do so that you could show the officers and others that you work for what you do in tandem with what they do as a badge carrier, hopefully headed in the same direction. You know, it reminds me of a zipper in that you have the two separate parts, whether it's the intelligence side or the officer side or the agent side, and both doing separate functions. But then when the zipper comes together, everything kind of forms to get the target and dismantlement that you talked about, the prosecution and conviction. And that's weaving together to paint the picture and to tell the story of what happened to get all those things accomplished. Yeah, just don't please uh, relabel the, the chart as a zipper flow. <laughs> I'm sure that will not happen. I can just imagine if we Google that right now, all the imagery that we would get. So yes, don't, don't do that. But I was just trying to give the listeners who are just listening to this on the podcast a, a visual of how this is set up and the, the two functionings coming together with one goal in mind. Yeah, my so. other side hobby, by the way, is on occasion, I like to be uh, a bit humorous and I, I tried some of the jokes at work and, and in general, my, my colleagues tell me not to quit my day job. So <laughs> I, I leave it there. Yes. Eventually that'll be your retirement job, right? Maybe. <laughs> All right. So let's finish up with personal interest and you have a collection hobby that I find fascinating. You know, you have over the years collected both British pottery and Russian paintings. And just go into how you got involved in this and things that you like and you look for and what particular aspects of both that you collect. Oh my gosh, the, uh, the pottery started when I was in England. Again, uh, three separate tours of duty, 10 years. I fell in love with a number of things and one of them happened to be 
pottery called Wedgwood. In particular, it was specifically the Jasper sort of pottery. Uh, and you can Google that to kind of get a, a see for what those uh, those look like. And I began collecting those in the UK. And I just love the feel of sort of a, it's sort of a coarse pottery unlike any other. And the the external designs are so intricate and very unique to Wedgwood. And I love the white on blue, the blue on white, the white on green. There's even white on black jasper. And I was able to actually find uh, some antique uh, Wedgwood pottery dating back to the early 1900s, which I have uh, have at home. I, I just love how ornate they are and the feel of them. And just it's just so unusual and, and fascinating. And, and uh, I even have Wedgwood clocks to go with my other clocks. So uh, at any given time, I'm hoping all the clocks are pretty much telling me the same time. But <laughs> uh, it's something that I love. Paintings uh, I, I collected are rather unique. One from, Saint, I think it was St. Petersburg. Actually, it's not one. It's a series of uh, paintings that were done by an artist named Tatiana Rusakova. And I'm, uh, I think I have, I don't know if I had the largest collection of those, but certainly have enough uh, in my home. And they're a uh, series of oil paintings that she uses a knife on canvas. Scenes of, of sidewalk cafes or scenes of buildings or scenes of fields, very beautiful. And I, I had all those framed as well as a recent uh, collection from another Russian artist also using the knife and oil on canvas. So uh, it's, it's a small collection that I have, but it's, it's fun. Maybe you can send me some pictures and we'll put them on the website so people can get a visual of uh, what this looks like. Sure. All right. Well, let's move on to our final segment, which is words of the world. This is where I give the guests the final word and then you can promote any idea that you would like. So David, what are your words to the world? Again, uh, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. No analyst uh, worth his or her weight in gold should ever operate in a vacuum. And most importantly, let your staff know that a basic analyst tenant should really be to promote sharing and most importantly, to welcome what the other views are that may not be consistent with yours. It may contrast with yours. And you're gonna to wanna to know why. You wanna know what the difference is. Well, very good. Well, I leave each guest with, you've given me just enough to talk bad about you later. But David, I do appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for being on the show and you take care and be safe. Thank you so much, Jason. Appreciate your time and best of luck on podcasts. We appreciate that volunteer effort on your part. Thank you for joining us today on Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. We hope you not only enjoyed the show, but also learned something new. For more information on our guests and information relating to today's topic, please visit our website at leapodcast.com. Special thanks to The Rough and Tumble for our theme song. For more of their music, you can visit their website at theroughandtumble.com. Also thanks to Kyle McMullen for our show logo. For more of his design, please visit his website at moderntype.com. The show is hosted, recorded, and edited by Jason Elder and written by me, Mindy. You can contact us both via the LEA podcast website. Please join us again next time as we interview another expert in this great field.